Welcome, everybody. So good to have you here today at all three of our Parker Hill locations. Today, we are continuing the series called Chasing Happy. And throughout this series, we've been talking about the fact that so many people go through life just chasing happiness, but never really finding it, or at least not finding it for very long. And the reason for that is that we tend to chase happy down all the wrong roads, and we end up going down dead-end streets that just leave us disappointed and disillusioned. But the fact that we spend so much time chasing happy means that the pursuit of happiness is big business in our world today. In fact, if you were to go on Amazon.com, you would discover that there are more than 2,000 books with titles about happiness and how to find it. Let me give you some examples. Uh, The Art of Happiness, 101 Ways to Happiness, 12 Simple Secrets of Happiness, 30 Days to Happiness, 99 Ways to Be Happier Every Day, and this one, 1,008 Secrets of a Happy Marriage, which, by the way, seems like a few too many to me to keep track of. Like, I'm doing well if I can remember, like, the anniversary thing and the take out the trash thing. I don't know about the 1,006 other secrets, but that's a lot. And then there's even a book that's called um, Your Happy, Healthy Basset Hound, which must be an incredible book because I've never seen a happy basset hound. And, And my point is this, we have more advice than ever before on history on how to be happy, and yet I would suggest to you that we've never in history been more unhappy than we are right now. In fact, let me share with you some statistics about our level of unhappiness in our culture today. In the United States... 18% of the adult population right now is being treated for anxiety disorders. In fact, of the 10 most commonly prescribed medications, seven of them are for the treatment of stress and anxiety. Now, don't misinterpret that. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing if, if you happen to take one of those medications. In fact, that is a gift from God. When you're struggling with stress, stress and anxiety and the physiological causes behind that, I mean, it can be great to have access to that kind of treatment. I'm just saying this. There are a lot of people out there just trying to keep their head above water when it comes to stress. It even affects the workplace. Listen to this. Third statistic, stress-related workers' compensation claims have increased by 400% in the last 10 years alone. And then one more, and this is just kind of interesting to me. I'm not sure what to make of it, but women are more likely than men to report having a great deal of stress. And I think maybe the reason for that is that it's the men that are creating the stress for the women. I'm not sure, but that's my guess. Here's my point. Happiness seems to be so far out of reach for so many people. We are just living in a world full of people who are beat up and disillusioned and let down. So where do we find happiness. Well, today as we continue this series, I want to come back to really a a, a principle that's foundational to this idea of finding joy, finding happiness, and it's this, that I can't always choose my circumstances, but I can always choose my response to those circumstances. And see, if you you base your joy and your happiness on your circumstances, you're eventually going to be in trouble because you can't choose your circumstances, can't control those. But you can always choose how you're going to respond in the midst of those circumstances. And here's what I believe and what we're going to talk about today. I believe it's possible to experience joy in any circumstances when you simply know how to respond in the right way and choose to respond in that way. And just to help you understand this idea, uh, I brought with me a couple of jars today. In this jar over here, uh, there there are some grapes. And uh, in this jar here, these are marble kind of things. They're glass, but they're kind of flat, so they're, they're, they're decorative uh, marble beads, okay? But I'm going to call them marbles, okay? Now, they look very similar. In fact, even on the screen, it may be hard to tell the grapes from the glass, but there's a really easy way to differentiate between grapes and glass, and that's with this, with a hammer. See, if I, I take a handful of these glass beads and I smash them with a hammer, do you know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get small, sharp pieces of broken glass. But if I take a few of these grapes and I smash them and a whole bunch more with a hammer, do you know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get grape juice. And if I leave it alone long enough, I might actually get wine. See, even though the the, the grapes and the glass look very similar, they respond very differently to the hammer. So here's my question for you. How do you respond to the pressures of life? 
See, my observation is that there are some people who respond to the pressures of life like these glass beads. They just shatter and they break into pieces and they, they hurt people in the process. But then there are other people that respond to the pressures of life like these grapes. It just seems like the more pressure you put on them, the more good stuff comes out of them. Because here's the truth about all of us. I can't always choose my circumstances, but I can always choose my response. So today, I want to talk about how to respond when we find ourselves in circumstances that have the potential to steal our joy. Now, for the last couple of months, we've been making our way through one book of the Bible, the book of Philippians. It's actually a letter written to Christians in the first century by Paul, the apostle, Christians living in the city of Philippi. And this has been our roadmap for the entire series. And today, we come to the final chapter in this letter, chapter 4. And we're going to cover the first nine verses. If you have a Bible and want to open up to this passage and follow along that way, that's great. Or find it on your Bible app. Or if you don't have either of those with you, we'll have the passage up on the screens for you as well. No extra charge for that. But let me just start by reading through these nine verses. Then we'll come back around, unpack it a little bit, and see what God may want to teach us today from this first century letter from Paul to the Christians in Philippi. But here's what he says, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things and whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now let me go back through that passage and let me just highlight for you three of the most common sources of anxiety in our lives, three things that constantly threaten to steal our joy. And the first one is this, unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict. Yeah, I think one of the greatest source of, sources of anxiety in life is relational conflict. Isn't that true? You can be wealthy, you can be successful, you can be talented, you can have a lot of things going well in life, but if, if your relationships are falling apart, I mean, that just drains the joy right out of you, especially if it's relationships with people that you really care about. And that was happening in this church in Philippi. And so Paul addresses an unresolved relational conflict there in the church between two people. Verse 2, he says this, he writes this, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to get new names. No, uh, to be of the same mind, he says. Now I want to stop here and just make a couple of observations. The first observation is this, that he actually uses their names in the letter which is so interesting to me because when the church got this letter, uh, they, they didn't photocopy it and hand it out to everybody. What they did was they got the church together, they gathered everybody together, and they read this letter out loud. And so, so what, imagine how that will, would feel if you're one of these two women and you're sitting there and you're hearing this letter read for the first time and your name comes up. Now, why would Paul do that? I'll tell you why he would do that because I think it's an indication that everybody in the church already knew about the problem that existed between these two women. Uh, they were all well aware of it. And I would suggest that maybe the entire church was being affected by it because here's what I've seen, that whenever you have unresolved conflict, whether it's in a family or in a workplace or in a church, that just kind of spreads like a stomach flu in a daycare. I mean, other people begins to take, begin to take sides and everybody's affected by it and it just drains the joy out of everybody. So he just says, here, he names them. Here's the second observation I would make about verse two, that uh, this wasn't a matter 
of, of a moral issue or something that was right or wrong or something that was black and white. And I say that because if it had been something that was clearly right or wrong, I think Paul would have said, listen, um, here's who's right and here's who's wrong. This is the truth. This is the error. But he doesn't do that. He just says, listen, you two need to figure this out and get over it. So apparently they were fighting about all the stuff that most of us fight about, which is kind of trivial stuff. So he says, I'm pleading with these women to resolve their differences and to be at peace with each other. See, I I can't always control my circumstances, but I can always control my response in those circumstances, even in conflict. And in those times when we find ourselves in conflict with someone else, we have to make a choice about how we're going to respond. I can decide to just, you know, marinate in my anger. I can decide to be stubborn and dig my heels in. I can decide just to walk away from that conflict. Or I can decide to try to resolve it. But you'll never find joy until you seek, to the best of your ability, to resolve that conflict. Now, how do we do that? I want to dig in a little bit deeper to the passage here. Because I think there's some tremendous wisdom for how we resolve conflict. And here's the first thing that I must do. Number one, I must value my relationships as much as my rights. Notice what Paul says here. He encourages them to be of the same mind in the Lord. In other words, he calls their attention to the fact that they are bound together by the common DNA of God's grace and his mercy and his love for them, that they're part of the very same spiritual family. And let me just say this, if you're a follower of Christ, No matter what opinions or preferences might possibly divide you from another follower of Christ, those are not more important than the relationship that you share with that person through the blood of a Savior. And and people who resolve conflict are people who understand, first of all, that I've got to value relationships more than I value my rights if I'm ever going to be someone who resolves conflict and experiences joy consistently. Here, here's the second thing I want to point out to you. Number two, I, I must be willing to involve others when necessary. Paul, he's writing this letter and he goes on to say this. He says, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women. And, and you know, who that true companion is that he's referring to, that's kind of lost to history. We don't know who that is exactly. But the bigger point is this, it was someone in the church who was godly and wise and mature, and Paul was saying, listen, just step in and sit down and help these two people figure it out. And, and the bigger takeaway that we, I think we need to learn from, the, from this verse is, is simply this, that there are going to be times if I'm really interested in resolving conflict with other people, then I'm going to involve others when necessary. Because when you come to Christ, you become part of his spiritual family. And from time to time, I think we just need to humble ourselves and say, you know what? The two of us can't figure this out. Maybe you can help us. And this is especially true, especially true if you're married. Don't ever be too proud to get counseling from a good counselor when you need that. Number three is this. I must not depend on people to give me what only Christ can give. He goes on to say this in verse 4, and you may not see the connection here at first, but there is a connection. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And it's interesting, when Paul writes the letter, he doesn't just say rejoice always. I don't think that would even be very helpful. It's like, how do you do that? He says this, rejoice in the Lord always. What does that mean? Well, if I were to change those three words, we would all understand the idea behind this. If I were to say to you, rejoice in your healthy baby, if I were to say rejoice in your new job or rejoice in the new car, we all understand what it means to rejoice in something. It means you focus on that good news to the point where the emotion of that just kind of washes over you. And to rejoice in the Lord simply means this, that you anchor your joy in God himself, not in your circumstances, not in the people around you, Paul says, listen, I want you to focus on the reality of God's grace, mercy, and love in your life. I want you to keep your focus on what God has done for you, and you find your joy in that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I think it's so important to read this verse in its context, because remember, he writes this just after he gets done writing about this problem of relational conflict and how to resolve that conflict. And and I think there's a point behind that, and that's this, that one of the biggest causes, I think, of anxiety and disappointment in our lives is when we try to find joy in people that don't always come through for us like we thought they would. And so many times our emotional stability 
is tied to someone else in our lives that fails to meet our expectations. And then when they fail to meet our expectations, we end up frustrated and joyless. And Paul is saying, I think, don't do that. Rejoice in the Lord, not just your circumstances, not people. Rejoice in the Lord's Lord. At the risk of sounding cynical, let me say this. Every single human being in your life will eventually disappoint you. And they can't help it because they're a sinner. They're imperfect. And so ultimately, we've got to stop expecting and demanding so much from other people. And I have to understand that ultimately, I'm going to find my joy not in a relationship, but in Christ himself. And you know what that frees me up to do? That frees me up to love someone else in a way that's unconditional because I don't need to demand something from them in order to love them. So then there's a summary statement here in verse five. Paul says, listen, let your gentleness be evident to all. And this is why we have to resolve conflict. Paul says, my brothers and sisters in Philippi, as the world around you looks in at you, The first thing they ought to see is your gentleness toward each other, your love for each other. The peace in your relationships ought to be the thing that is most evident to them. And do you know how that's possible? Because you you know this, the Lord is near. In other words, God hasn't gone anywhere. In in other words, you, you need to look beyond your disappointments with each other and your differences with each other and see the unseen reality of God's presence. And when you do that, then you're gonna live with a spirit of gentleness. So we all face conflicts in our relationships. And we can't always change that. We can't always control that. But we can always control our response. In fact, Paul, in another letter that he writes to the Christians in Ephesus, he makes the same point, but he does it with a great deal of urgency. Here's what he says in Ephesians 4. He says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Uh, As you may know, a foothold is a rock climbing term. A foothold is what allows a climber to scale a rock face that would otherwise be unclimbable. And the point is this, that when you don't resolve conflict and we don't don't resolve it right away, you give the, the evil one an opportunity to get traction in your life. You give him a grip on your heart And you allow him to steal your joy if you don't resolve this stuff right away. So I want to encourage you to make a commitment, a commitment that will lead you to joy. In fact, throughout the message here, I just want to give you three habits of happiness. So here's the first habit of happiness. It's this. I will choose to resolve my conflicts to the best of my ability. I'm just going to make that a habit of my life. I'm not just going to walk away. I'm not going to be stubborn. I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to be gossip. Gossipy, I'm not not just going to marinate my anger. I'm going to choose to resolve my conflicts because when you do that, then you're going to have a lot more joy in your life. Now, let me tell you about the second thing that has the potential to steal our joy. The, The second thing that leads to so much anxiety in our lives, and that is this, unexpected problems. Unexpected problems. Unresolved conflict was the first one. Unexpected problems is the second one. Now, I had the strangest thing happen to me. Um, a few days ago. And so let me tell you about it because I think it, it'll, it'll get us into this point really well. I, was, uh, I got into my car. My car was sitting in my driveway and I got into my car and I looked over and there was a, a, a dead bird in my car, uh, actually on the floor mat in front of the passenger side seat. And it was a beautiful bird. It was a, it was a red cardinal and it was dead in my car. In fact, uh, I took a picture of it And in just a moment, I'm going to show you a picture of it just to prove that it really happened. Now, if you don't want to see a picture of a dead bird, just go ahead and close your eyes, okay? So don't send me an email, Uh, but I'm just going to show it real quick, quickly, just so you you can see what I saw when I got into my car, okay? So here we go. Here's the picture. Okay, there he is. Poor guy. Okay, you can take that down now, okay? So I get in the car, and at first, you know, I couldn't figure out what had happened. Uh, I had been in my car about 30 minutes before that, left my car in the driveway. Now I get back in, and, and here's the poor bird. He's, he's dead. But then I look around, begin to put the pieces together, okay? Here, here's what I saw. My driver's side window was open. My passenger side window was closed. And there were some bird feathers on the armrest on the passenger side door. Just a few, just a few. And immediately I knew what happened. You know what happened? That bird was chasing happy and did not realize that even though the driver's side window was open, the passenger side window was closed. 
and he chased Happy right into that window. Now, I thought to myself when I saw that, you know, I don't want to let this bird die in vain. So I'm going to redeem his life by making him a sermon illustration and bring some good, you know, out of that tragedy. So here it is, here it is. That's how life feels sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, it's amazing how you can be cruising along through life and everything seems to be going great. Then you get that telephone call. Then you get that email. Then you get that knock at the door. Then you get that medical report. And it's one of those moments when everything changes and you crash head on into the reality of life in a broken world. What do you do then? What do you do when you run up against full speed those unexpected problems? Listen to what Paul writes next in this letter. He says, do not be anxious about anything. And what's so, so amazing here, what's so incredible is he doesn't say, you know, don't be anxious about the small stuff like, you know, gaining five pounds or finding another gray hair or something small like that. He says, do not be anxious about anything, anything in your life. Now, it's important to remember, in case you're wondering, that Paul knew something about problems. He had been arrested. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked almost drowned. Now he was under house arrest awaiting a trial that could very well result in his execution. And here's what he says. Don't be anxious about anything. Remember, he didn't write this from a beach house in Hawaii. He was somebody who knew pain, who knew disappointment, who knew difficulty. And he lived this and he said, hey, there's no need to be anxious when you face those unexpected problems. But the best part is this. He doesn't stop there. He gives an alternative way of responding because you can't always choose your circumstances, but you can choose your response. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But here, here's a better alternative. In every situation, divorce, illness, death, loss of your job, in every situation, by prayer and petition. And these two words are very important here, with thanksgiving. You know, gratitude for God for past provision, gratitude for who he is, gratitude for how he's going to work out this situation, even in all of the anxiety that comes with it. Sometimes I think we're stressed about the future because we don't spend enough time being thankful for the past. But with thanksgiving, here's what you do. You present your request to God. In other words, whenever you have unexpected problems in your life, you're faced with a choice. You gotta choose how to respond. You can respond with fear and anger and hopelessness and escapism and impulsive decisions, or you can just stop and pause and turn to God in prayer and you can say, Lord, this situation, this problem is way too big for me to handle alone. So I'm going to place this into your hands. And God, I've done everything I can do about this job. I've done everything I can do medically. God, I've done everything I can do about my financial situation. I've done everything I can do to rescue this marriage. God, I'm just going to leave it at your feet. I'm going to put it in your hands. And I'm just going to entrust it to you. Uh, there was a newspaper in Minneapolis, Minnesota that had a section in the Sunday paper where they would allow people to respond to questions and, and uh, give, give their input. And there was one particular question one Sunday that they allowed people to respond to, and it was this question, what is your strategy for coping with stress? And there were, there were all kinds of answers. You know, people uh, said th- that they would, you know, eat lots of chocolate or have a stiff drink or they would go shopping. But there was one guy that I thought had the best answer of all. He said this, He said, every January 1st, I give my wife $10, and she worries about everything for both of us. But I like the next part even better. He said this, if anyone else wants to be worry-free, they can also send her $10. That's like multi-level marketing for stress. I don't know what that is. But here's my point. If you're a follower of Christ, whatever problems you may have in your life, you have permission to hand them over to your heavenly Father. And it will not cost you anything except your pride. All you need to do is humble yourself enough to say, God, this is bigger than I can handle, and I don't know what else to do at this point. So with thanksgiving, with prayer, with petition, I'm going to entrust this to you. But then, but then there's a promise attached to this if we do this. It goes on in verse 7 to say this. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and here's what will happen. And the peace of God 
Not the peace of circumstances, not the peace of, you know, everything's great in my life. No, but the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. We'll talk about that in a minute. Will guard your hearts and minds. And I love that phrase because I imagine Paul's there. He's under house arrest. He's chained to a guard. And he's thinking, you know, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. What will it do? What will it do? Oh, I know. It'll guard your hearts and minds. It'll keep watch over them in Christ Jesus. Do you see the promise here? The promise is not that the problem will go away. The promise is, that, is not that your spouse will return. The, the promise is not that your boss will change his mind and you'll get your job back. You know, the promise is, is not that the cancer will be cured. I mean, there are many, many times when prayer is answered that way. That's just not the point here. That's not the promise here. The promise here is that there's gonna be a peace within your heart that has no human explanation a peace that it says here transcends all understanding, which means this, it's the kind of peace where people look at you and they say, dude, with everything that you've been dealing with, how can you be doing so well emotionally? Where did you get that kind of peace? That's the promise when we entrust our problems into God's hands. There's an author by the name of Tony Campolo who tells a story that really, I think, explains the connection between prayer and peace. It's from his website. Let me read it for you. He says, I was in a church in Oregon not too long ago, and I prayed for a man who had cancer. In the middle of the week, I got a telephone call from his wife. She said, you prayed for my husband. He had cancer. I said, had? Oh, I thought to myself, it worked. She said, he died. I felt terrible. She continued, don't feel bad. When he came into church that Sunday, he was filled with anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short period of time, and he hated God. He was 58 years old, and he wanted to see his children and grandchildren grow up. He was angry that this all-powerful God didn't take away his sickness and heal him. He would lie in bed and curse God. The more his anger, anger grew toward God, the more miserable he was to everybody around him. It was an awful thing to be in his presence. But after you prayed for him, a peace had come over him and a joy had come into him. She writes, she said, Tony, the last three days have been the best days of our lives. We've sung, we've laughed, we've read scripture, we've prayed. Oh, they've been wonderful days. And I called to thank you for laying your hands on him and praying for healing. And then she said something incredibly profound. She said this, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. See, that's the promise in this passage here in Philippians 4. It's not a promise that all your problems are gonna go away. It's the promise that in the midst of those problems, you're gonna find a peace and you're gonna find a joy that really has no human explanation. And when you go through life with that kind of peace, you're gonna stand out in this world and people are gonna look at you and they're gonna see a joy in you and a peace in you that, that can't be explained and they're gonna be drawn to that. So let me tell you the second habit of happiness. The first habit of happiness, just choose to resolve my conflicts. The second habit of happiness is I will choose to release my problems and just say, God, I've done everything I can do. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna experience the anxiety of this. I'm just gonna entrust this into your hands. And then let me tell you the third thing that has the potential to steal our joy, and it's this, it's unhealthy thoughts. You know, sometimes the thing that robs us of our joy is not the people around us, it's not the circumstances that we find ourselves in, it's the thoughts that we allow to live in our minds. All kinds of unhealthy thoughts. It may be just kind of a low level anger where you allow your mind to dwell on past hurts and past insults, and you just replay those tapes over and over in your mind, that's what you think about might be thoughts of condemnation where you're just focused on your failures and what you've done in the past and you wish you could go back and do it over again and you're just, you're just consumed with those thoughts. It might be thoughts of insecurity where you mentally compare yourself with somebody else or with some cultural standard and convince yourself that you just don't measure up. It might be thoughts of discontentment. You know, I wish I had her husband. I wish I had a different wife. I wish I had better kids. I wish I had a new kitchen. I wish I had a better car. You know, those thoughts of discontentment, whatever those thoughts might be, if we engage in those thoughts long enough, they're gonna steal the joy from our hearts. And so Paul, he goes on to write and he says this in verse eight. He says, finally, 
Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, those are the things you should think about. Think about such things. Here's why. There's a direct relationship between the thoughts that fill our minds and the joy that's in our hearts. And you can't always choose what thoughts are going to enter your mind. None of us can. But we always get to choose whether or not we're going to dwell on them. And when I discover that I'm, my thoughts are being consumed with the things that are stealing my joy, then I've just got to choose to replace those thoughts with different thoughts and think about whatever's true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. It's, it's like the difference, as long as we're talking about birds, difference between two kinds of birds. A hummingbird, so it's an amazing part of God's creation. A hummingbird can flap its little wings like 75 times per second. And maybe you've seen one hovering over a flower like this. And what the hummingbird is doing in this picture is, is he's getting his food from that flower, deep within that flower. It's a sweet substance called nectar. Now compare that to a vulture. A vulture spends his time looking for dead things, looking for um, dead animals and decaying flesh. And here's the thing. Both animals find exactly, both birds find exactly what they're looking for. The hummingbird finds nectar. The vulture always finds dead things. And I believe that in the world that we live, you will always find what you're looking for. Whatever you fill your mind, want to fill your mind with, you can find it. And you can choose to fill your mind with thoughts of fear and greed and lust and resentment and discontentment. Or you can choose to focus your mind on other things that build your faith and give you hope. I remember a personal experience I had with this years ago when my kids were younger. I got up one morning, and this was a season in my life when I was just dealing with a lot of discouragement and just kind of feeling overwhelmed with the challenges of leadership. And a lot of my days uh, were filled with just very negative thoughts. And I get up one morning, none of my family was up yet. They were still all in bed. It was very early in the morning. And I walked by a table in the living room, and there was a note on the table from my 10-year-old daughter. It wasn't written to me. In fact, it wasn't even written to anyone in particular. It's just something she decided to write. It was just two words. This was the note. It just said, be happy. And I walked by that, and it was amazing how instantly that shifted my perspective. It was like a gift from God, just a reminder, even in the handwriting of my child, that I have so much to be happy about, so much to be thankful for. And I'll tell you what, when we find ourselves consumed by unhealthy thoughts, we just got to make a choice. We got to make a choice how we're going to respond. We can dwell on those thoughts or we can choose to replace those thoughts. Here's the third habit of happiness. It's this. I will choose to replace my thoughts. I'm going to resolve my conflicts. We're going to release our problems. We're going to choose to replace those thoughts. And when we choose to pursue these habits of happiness, here's the summary, verse 9. Here's what Paul writes. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Put this stuff into practice. Resolve those conflicts immediately. Uh, you know, replace those thoughts immediately. You, you, you know, you, you need to release those problems immediately. You put that into practice. You make those things habitual. You make them a part of your, of your life. And here's the result of that. And the God of peace will be, be with you. The God of peace will be with you. Not just the peace of God, but the God of peace will be with you. And that's what we all want, isn't it? We all go through life chasing happy, chasing joy, chasing hope, chasing peace. But here's the thing. We can't control our circumstances and better not base our happiness on those circumstances. But we can always choose our response. And we're going to give you a chance to respond as we wrap up today. Just stay seated. Uh, you don't have anywhere more important to go in the next few minutes. We're going to have the band come on back up to the stage because we're going to end our time together with one more song. And we're going to spend these few minutes looking beyond the people and the circumstances and the thoughts that fill our lives and look beyond all that to see the one who is the only true and lasting source of joy and hope. And in just a few minutes as we sing that song, I want you to listen for these lyrics when the song says, you are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true, even in my wandering, and this, you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. See, that's where happiness is found. That's where joy is found in him.